Good morning, church. I'm Josh, and this is your In the Know. Welcome to our Family Reunion Sunday. We are so glad to have you with us today. Next week, we have some incredible things that we want to make you aware of. First off is our Family Worship Conference starting this Friday. It's also going to be on Saturday morning and even some small groups on Sunday morning. This is going to be an incredible time with Jonathan Williams, where he'll be sharing his heart about how to have Christ as the heart of our home. Families, I cannot encourage you enough. Get signed up and be a part of it. We're going to have a great dinner on Friday night and a lot of laughs, and it's going to be a great time. You can sign up at fbfirst.com. We also have our fall choral concert on October 1st. That's next Sunday at 6 o'clock p.m. This is going to be an incredible opportunity for you to come out, enjoy some music, worship, and just have a great time with your family. Invite all of your friends. Invite your co-workers, your neighbors. We want as many people here as possible. Miss Jennifer and her choral team have been doing an amazing job about setting this choir concert up, and it's going to be amazing. Guys, we have so much going on. Please get connected through our social media, through our website, through our app, everything that we offer to communicate so that you don't miss out on anything that we do here at FB First. I'm Josh, and now you're in the know. Good morning, church family. We are starting off today with a baptism of my buddy Cooper. Um, and the, the time we've had here at FB First, Kaylee and I have had the privilege of watching Cooper grow in his faith and, and just uh, make that decision to follow Jesus. So today we're celebrating that as the church, the body of Christ. We have a new brother um, that has joined the family of God. So we're going to baptize him. Cooper, have you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ? Yes. Well, because of your profession of faith. I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, buried with him in baptism, and raised to walk in newness of life. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Awesome. You can walk in. Awesome. Well, let's pray. Let's pray, and then we'll get started. Dear God, thank you so much for this day. God, I thank you so much for everything you've done. God, we love you. We praise you. We honor you. God, I thank you so much for Cooper making the decision to follow you. God, I pray that there would be more children in our ministry that would continue to follow you, Father. You said, let the little children come to me and don't forbid them. God, please help children to come. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's pray for a moment. Close your eyes and let's just dream. Imagine when that building is constructed right where you're standing. Imagine what's going to take place in there. It may be boys and girls coming to faith in Jesus. It may be Bible study classes being taught, conferences being held. It may be someone's wedding. It may be the wedding of your child. Or it could be the reception. It may be a memorial service for someone who meant a lot to this community and this church. But with the eye of faith, just imagine what God's going to do through this building. It's more than a structure. It's where memories will be created and faith will be nurtured. Our children, our future, will find their spiritual home here. We've been working diligently, one, to make sure that this is a God-honoring project and that our goal is to see lives change through this effort. We've also gone into this with a desire to enter this building when it is complete, debt-free. This building isn't just walls and a roof. It's a testimony to our faith, our unity. Father, we pray that it's a building that would honor you. It'll never be worthy of you, but may it honor you. We've embarked on this journey together. And God, would you use this new queen, Father, for disciple making, for training up champions of Christ through our Christian school. We have done an amazing job in getting close to that goal, but we're still not there yet. We have just over a million dollars that we still need to raise, 
and we want to make sure that as a church, we finish strong. I'm reminded of Paul's words in Philippians when he tells us to keep our eyes on the prize. And as we complete this project, we want to honor God in completing it well and debt free. So please join me as we celebrate this accomplishment and join us in making sure we get over the finish line. Now, let's finish what we started and let's leave a legacy.
that is worthy of our praise this morning. Amen. And because of his name and his plan, it can be well with our souls. When the peace like a Thank you, choir. Thank you, worship team. If you thought that was good, just wait till next Sunday night, 6 o'clock p.m., our fall, our choral concert. Let there be light. It's going to be an amazing time of worship, an amazing time of encouragement. We just want to remind you to be there. Bring a friend. Invite somebody. You might have some people that, you know, they work on Sunday mornings. They're not available. They always kind of give you that excuse, right? Sunday nights, people aren't doing anything. Get them out here. It's going to be a great time. It's going to be, it's going to bless your soul. That's for sure. We want to welcome you here to FB First. Today is our family reunion Sunday. And we're going to do things here that are our favorite things to do at FB First. We had great worship. We're going to continue that worship. We're going to have great preaching here soon. We had a baptism. So many things to celebrate. And then here in a little bit, we're going to eat some great food. 
It's going to be great. There's some games and inflatables. There's even going to be like an axe throwing thing for us. I mean, there's lots of good stuff going on today. It's great to be here. If you're a guest with us, we want to welcome you. We're so glad that you chose to worship with us this morning. We want to connect with you. We want to get to know you. A couple of ways that you can help us out with that. There's these connection cards in the seats in front of you. Uh, you can just take one of those and fill it out. Put your family's information on there. We're not going to spam you with a whole lot of mail and emails. But we want to get to know you. And that's just a quick way that you can do to help us with that. Take that card. And as you move around our campus, getting in line for the food, you'll see our giving boxes. Uh, put your card in that giving box so that we can have record of your visit. Typically, Pastor Zach and Miss Julie, we have a pastor's reception area after the service. Today, after the service, they're going to head over to uh, pray for the food and everything over there for the dinner, but they would still love to meet you over there. You can swing by their table and say hi. But put that card in that box so that we can get connected with you. You can also do it on your cell phone. Text Hello First to 97,000. People do it every single week. It's a great way to get connected so you can find out what's going on here at FB First for your family. Let's take a moment, let's greet those around us, and then we're going to get back to worship.
Let's pray together. Jesus, thank you so much for having your hand in our lives and your presence, God, and your presence and your hand on our church. Father, we pray that for future generations that we will build up kingdom people. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to worship you and come and receive the word that you have given, Zach. We love you and we praise you and it's your holy name we pray. Amen. You may be seated.
If you have your copy of God's Word, open it to the book of Luke, chapter 6, find verse 27 with me this morning. As you study the different philosophies and religions of the world, you're going to see that there are certain things they have in common, that they all generally hold to be true. Commands like honor your father and mother can be found in most any holy book that you were to read. Some form of the golden rule can be found in Judaism and Hinduism and Islam. Commands to help the poor are common among all of the world's religions. Yet there are some things with Christianity that set it apart, that make it distinct. For example, the exclusivity and the divine nature of Jesus Christ. The concept that salvation can come by grace through faith alone. And the command that we see here before us today, to love our enemies. This is one of those commands that everybody struggles with, but I think Americans struggle with a little bit more. It almost feels un-American, doesn't it? To love your enemies. But that's what we're commanded to do. And I think about this command, I tend to think it's good for you all to love your enemies. It's, it's, It's my enemies that I have a problem with that list of my enemies, they got on there for a good reason, you know. How am I to love them? Yet, as the Lord surveys the whole of humanity, He looks at the people you most dislike, you most distrust, and you most disapprove of, and He points that nail-scarred hand at them and says, go love that one. What a word. We've said at uh, at the beginning of this series, and especially as we got into this Sermon on the Mount portion of Luke, that uh, really what he's doing here is he's uh, giving a kingdom mandate. Remember that we said in the beginning, when Adam was created and Eve made from Adam, that Adam was given dominion over the whole of this planet that God had gloriously furnished and he sat there in the city of Eden as a capital city and he was commanded to take everything that was there in Eden and to fill the entire planet with such a paradise and he was in a sense the king he had dominion but then uh, he heard the word of the serpent that ancient dragon Satan He heard the word of Satan, and he trusted the word of Satan over that of his creator. And as a result, he subjugated his kingdom to a different lordship. Previously, he operated as a direct report to his creator. He would walk with God in the cool of the day, in the midst of the garden. But now, he he has a different worldview He sees it through satanic eyes. He's still an image bearer, but the image has been marred to some degree. The drama of the Old Testament really begins after the fall when God says, I'm going to correct all of this. Everything that's been lost by Adam here in the garden will be made right by a male descendant of the first human couple, the seed of He says the seed will come. He identifies him in the masculine. He says a a man will be born of a woman. And one day he will crush the head of the serpent. 
You see, Satan's kingdom was established there, and it continues. He's called the God of this world, the king. He has a, a satanic kingdom, and he has a dominion. But one day, from within that world, a new king who would be called a Messiah would arise. And he would crush the head of Satan, in effect, taking away his dominion and his kingdom, and in the process, his heel would be bruised. Now, that's somewhat of a euphemism to say through the cross, Jesus would reclaim uh, the kingship of planet Earth, and he would begin to establish his dominion now as the second Adam upon the planet. The drama unfolds all the way through. Uh, Abraham is called. You see the judges. You see the kings. You see, you know, Israel established as a, 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 a prototype kingdom. And then it happens. All that the world has been waiting on for all of these generations, that anticipation is answered with a baby's cry in that little town of Bethlehem. The king has been born. He comes, he heals, the kingdom begins to spill over, as it were, as a little mustard seed planted in this satanic soil until it spreads across the Middle East and ultimately into all the world, until right here where we are in North Florida. And we await the ultimate coming of the king, the second advent, the second coming of our king, King Jesus. He had conquered death, hell, and the grave. He had made it possible for the descendants of Adam to enter into the kingdom. He gathers his uh, disciples around him, and, and he says in Matthew 28, verse 18, now listen to these words. Never overlook these words again. Jesus says, all authority have been given to me in heaven and on earth. All authority, all dominion, everything Adam had before, Jesus has now. But he answered Satan appropriately rather than subjugate himself to him. Remember the temptation we studied a few weeks ago. So Jesus now as the king, the ultimate king, he says, now go therefore into all the world and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to observe all I have commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the ends of the age. And that's what the church is here for. That's why we exist. We are a disciple-making organization. We are emissaries of the King. We are sent as an advanced troop ahead of a coming army that no man can number. But it's coming. And we are that advanced troop going ahead of them, living as strangers and aliens in a land that is not our own. But we, we do so boldly. We do so with humility, but we do so with courage because we know um, we don't believe, we're not Gnostics. Gnostics kind of have this ethereal idea that, that uh, out there in space somewhere there's heaven. And it's all good. It's altogether lovely. And down here everything's bad. And so one day we want to get out of this place and go to that place to where it's spiritual, good, and lovely. The truth is we're not going to be up there that long until up there comes down here. Heaven's coming to earth. And the goal was the goal in the beginning, that this beautiful planet God has created could be reborn and remade apart from sin, and King Jesus to rule and to reign from a heavenly kingdom. And here in Jerusalem, he will rule and he will reign, the kings of the earth. And we're the advanced party going out before that coming invasion to where Jesus reclaims everything that was uh, deeded over to him at the resurrection. And so here we are, and we have said already we operate in at least four realms of existence, each one subjugated to King Jesus, but each one relating to him differently. Now this is an interpretive key that you must understand to read your Bible and make sense of it. 
there's the self, and there are certain commands that are given to you as a Christ follower individually. Then you have three other gatherings of individual selves. You have the church, you have the state, uh, and you have the family. The, the family is entrusted with some things that the state's not entrusted with. The state's entrusted with some things that the church is not entrusted with. And they all are under the authority, ultimately, of the Lord Jesus Christ. They all have an accountability to him. And they all have a slightly different ethical framework. And here's what I mean by that. There are some things that only the family can do, only the church can do, and only the state can do. Capital punishment, the power of the sword, is vested with the state. It's not given to the church, and it's not given to the family. Corporal punishment of children is given to the family, not the church, not the state. You see how that works? There's some things, and so when God is speaking, you have to determine to which of the realms of existence is he speaking to. In the Sermon on the Mount, he's speaking to you as an individual. And he says, as you go out as, a, as an emissary of the kingdom, as you walk in the blessing of the Lord, this is how you are to behave. This is how you are to respond. And in the text today, he's talking about how you personally, as a subject of the king of all kings, how you personally should respond to personal offenses. Has anybody in here ever experienced a personal offense? Have you ever been on social media? Have you ever walked the street? I mean, what are, how are we to be different than those who do not yet know the Lord Jesus Christ. He's not speaking to national defense when he says things like turn the other cheek. That's not an argument for laying down our weaponry. He's not speaking even of personal defense of your family or your church. We have a security team here, you see. But he's speaking personally. If somebody offends you, if they make themselves out to be your enemy, how are you to relate to them? With that in mind, he gives us a strategy. A strategy, one assumes, is supposed to work. Right? Uh, some, some of our ball teams yesterday had a good strategy. Others did not. Congratulations to FSU, by the way. Way to go. Coming along. Um, but the strategy is intended to work. They all intended to win, I think. But they, they went forward with that goal in mind. Well, in what way is loving our enemies supposed to be a good tactic, a good strategy? We're going to see it more clearly as we get into the text. But it is assumed, if you will obey this text and believe this text, that the kingdom will fare better than if you don't. So understand, this is not wasted words just to make your life a little more difficult. This is a goal for the good of the kingdom until King Jesus returns that you operate this way, anticipating it's going to work, okay? So the first thing we see is that Christians have categories. Look at verse 27. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies. That in itself makes us a little bit uncomfortable. Why is that? Because Jesus is suggesting that of all of the people that you survey here on planet earth, that there are some that you should put in a particular category that's a negative category. Doesn't sound like Jesus, does it? At least it doesn't sound like Jesus as he's been presented to us here in the West. What do I mean by that? I mean that many pastors have fallen into a trap uh, to where they preach basically self-help. It's what Christian Smith described as uh, moralistic, therapeutic deism. In other words, it's moralistic, it's, it's, it's ethical in nature, it's therapeutic, it's meant to help your life be better, and it's got some God language in there. 
As a result, what we've discovered is that there are certain verses that we've zeroed in on to the exclusion of everything else that Scripture says. Such as, we're going to come to it here in a a few days, uh, judge not lest you also be judged. And so we believe that gives us every uh, excuse to not really have any discernment whatsoever. And it shocks us when we read verses like today's verse where Jesus says, no, you should discern that there are people that you deal with that fit into a negative category called an enemy. You've got to see that first of all. There are categories of people. Here are a few. It's not exhaustive, but here are a few as you think as a kingdom-minded person. One is that of an enemy. It's in our text, obviously. They typically self-identify, don't they? If you wonder if somebody's your enemy, uh, give it time. They'll show you. Um, The second is that of family. And it can be used in a physical or a spiritual sense. But I'm thinking here more along the lines of, of spiritual. It's our brothers and sisters in Christ. This is our, as Jesus said, uh, our mothers and fathers in the Lord, our elders. These are our spiritual family. We have allies. That's people that aren't necessarily in our tribe, but we have shared common goals with those people. There are co-belligerents. That's people that under ordinary circumstances, they might be the enemy. But in a particular skirmish, they might work with us to achieve a common goal. As Dr. Falwell used to say, I will let anybody help me kill a snake. So if there's somebody that we would look at and say, hey, that person's not even a Christian, but we can all agree that what's happening in this situation, uh, whether it be right to life or whether it be uh, some ethical issue related to our community, uh, we can all agree that this is bad then we can all have a, we we can work with co-belligerents to that end without suggesting that we're on the same team. That's, That's good and that's right and that's okay. You see it all throughout scripture. A negative example of it would be when the Herodians and the Pharisees worked together to eliminate Jesus. They agreed on nothing except that Jesus had to go. So that's a negative example. I can show you positive examples from the life of King David and all throughout uh, Israel's history. Another category is that of a traitor. It's the person that presents themselves as family, but they're really an enemy. Jesus had one on his team. We'll meet him uh, as the story continues. So you have to have a working knowledge of those categories to make sense of how you flesh this stuff out. And, And one of the reasons Scripture is so odd to some of us is because we don't allow for those type of categories. Once you see that, you'll go, okay, I see how I'm supposed to treat him. I see how I'm supposed to treat her because they're in the enemy category. Christians have categories. Secondly, if Jesus told us to love our enemies, the second thing we know is Christians have enemies. You will have enemies in this life. Consider the fact that we preach Jesus as our king. Jesus was the perfect man. He was God in the flesh. Never sinned. He did all things well, and he does all things well. Yet when he visited this planet, they nailed him to a cross. And then there's the rest of us who follow him by faith. No perfection among us. We've all done things in the course of our life, even uh, since our conversion, that we look at and we are embarrassed of the ways that we have behaved. Yet, we're preaching the same kingdom that Jesus was. If they nailed him to a cross, what will they do to us? If they nailed the perfect one to the cross, what will they do to you? Thus, Scripture says, all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. It's a guarantee There's enemy language all throughout the New Testament. You see it in Philippians 3.18, that many, he says, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Romans 11.28 says, from the standpoint of the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. Of the magician Bar-Jesus, Paul said in Acts 13, 
He says, you who are full of deceit and fraud, the son of the devil, the enemy of all righteousness. So Christians will have enemies. It helps if you can be clear on a couple of things. We know exactly who our ultimate enemy is. It's not a person, but it's Satan and demons. That's our ultimate enemy. That's the one we're working to destroy. That's the one we want to see cast into oblivion. That's the one we want to annihilate. Ephesians 6, 12. For you do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against cosmic powers over this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Believing that will change how you relate to people. So your enemy is is not your spouse. It's not your ex-spouse. It's not your neighbor, it's not your boss, it's not your employee, it's not your teacher, it's not your coach. Your real enemy is behind all that. Your real enemy is spiritual in nature. Well, what are we fighting for? What is the battle for? It's for the enslaved hearts and minds of people. Now, this is where, why you must not confuse who the ultimate enemy is. As you look out over the people on this earth who have made themselves out to be your enemy and that are in that category, behind them is your real enemy who has sway over the people. You have to leave yourself open to the reality that the people may convert. They may come to Christ. And you have to hold grace in your heart that says, wouldn't that be wonderful? Saul of Tarsus, case point. Saul of Tarsus, uh, an enemy of all righteousness, an enemy of the church. Then he meets King Jesus on the road one day and he's gloriously saved. Whoever you look at as an enemy or whoever looks at you as an enemy, you have to remember the goal is to set them free from the enslavement of our true enemy. So we can't treat them differently than we would treat Satan if we were able, you see. They're not our ultimate enemy. Preacher was preaching one day, same text, love your enemies. And he did what preachers do. You know, you start out and you say, how many of you are willing to go out of here and and forgive all your enemies and love them uh, for the rest of this week? And about half of them raise their hand. And uh, he says, let's try that again. Next time, about 80% of them raised their hand. Well, he kept going until almost everybody in the building had raised their hand except for one little old lady who was 93 years of age. She just sat there. And he says, well, Miss Maud, um, I see you didn't raise your hand. Can you tell me why? And she said, well, honey, I don't have any enemies. And he said, well, can you tell the rest of the church how you got to a place in your life where you don't have any enemies when the rest of us do. She said, well, honey, I I outlived all of them. (laughs) So, unless you outlive them, you're going to have enemies. They're going to be there. So Christians have categories. Christians have enemies. Thirdly, Christians have a plan. We don't have to wonder about what to do. We don't have to stress about it. We don't even have to pray about it, to be frank. We have a command, clear as crystal, on how we're to treat our enemies. Look at verse 27, the B part. Love those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. And to the one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. Now, that one in particular has always been a stumbling block for Christians. What do we do with that? We're just going to let people beat us up? Let me explain it to you. Pastor Dan, come here for a minute. (laughs) He gets paid well, y'all. Don't don't, don't feel so bad for him. So, Pastor Dan's here. If I, okay, hold hold up your right hand. Hold up your left hand. Put the right one down. There we go. So, that's his left. That's his right. Most people are right-handed, Correct. So if I'm going to smite him with my right hand, what must I do? Reach over. Oh, and it says on the right cheek. I must reach over here and backhand him. Do you see how that works? What Jesus is describing here is not an assault. 
it's a personal offense. This is how a Jewish person would kind of spit in the face of an enemy. To reach over here and backhand them. Jesus says, if, if a person does that to you, personal offense, then offer them the other cheek as well. Thank you, Pastor. I appreciate you. A lot of trust there. So, Annie's bigger than me, so um, he could take me out, is what I mean. So, if somebody personally insults, offends, comes against you, let it go, man. Let it go. Learn how to say probably some of the best advice uh, I ever had, I have ever heard. It was two staff members. You know, staff can be mean. I'm just telling you, we can be. It was two staff members of my previous church. One was really coming against the other, and he was assaulting, he was degrading, insulting this other staff member. The other staff member just sat back and smiled. And I thought, what's he going to do? And it, when, when the fellow finished berating him, the other staff member looked at him and said, I'm a lot worse than all the things you just said. I, I, I'm a wicked, evil sinner. But thank God for grace. You know, that's a little bit of spiritual judo, isn't it? Being able to say, you don't know how awful I really am. But I promise you it's worse than the things you just said. But Jesus loves me, he saved me, and he made me his very own. Now that's the way you approach an enemy. So what I'm telling you is, don't take the mandate here to turn the other cheek and apply that to national defense. That's not what he's saying. Don't take that and say, well, if somebody breaks in your house and they want to uh, hurt your family, uh, then just let them do it. That's not what he's saying. You can defend yourself. You can defend your family. You can defend your country. Uh, you can defend your church. But if it's a personal insult, the backhand, just chill out. Jesus says, I've got that one, okay? I've got your back. Let it go. And then look at verse 29. And the one who takes your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you, and from the one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish the, that others would do to you, do so to them. So Jesus says, if someone makes themselves out to be your enemy, or an enemy of what you stand for, here's some practical ways that you're to respond to them. Notice he, he doesn't say you're to feel anything in particular. Uh, but we tend to kind of get caught up in that, that it's a feeling he's asking us to have. More often than not, love in the Scripture is a verb. It's something we do, not something we feel. The feelings tend to catch up with our actions. We will typically change how we feel toward them but our behavior toward them is how love is actually expressed. There's five things he says. So as I preach, if somebody's come to your mind and you go, oh, yeah, she's an enemy, he's an enemy, there's five of them, um, what do you do? Do good to them? Do good to them? Whatever is good, do that to them. Bless them. So you're going to take the initiative, you're going to speak well on their behalf, and you're going to speak well to them. Pray for them. Go to God on their behalf. Four, do not retaliate against them. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, thus saith the Lord. And five, show them generosity. So Christians are not primarily transactional. We don't give in order to get. We give because we have been given to. So be generous in all ways toward that's what he means by if they take your coat give them your tunic as well be generous god's got your back be generous that in itself will speak volumes this is how we are to love our enemies if this is how we are to love our enemies what what of our friends can you imagine if we treat our enemies that way how glorious the community would be within the context of the church because our friends, man, if we treat our enemies this graciously, how awesome would it be to be a Christian and to be a member of a church, to watch us, and all throughout the New Testament, is that not what they said? Behold how they love one another. They have just such awesome, pure, uh, sincere love one for another. That's how it should be. 
Christians have categories. Christians have enemies. Christians have a plan for how they are to respond to their enemies. But four, Christians have a motive of why. Why? What's the motive here? Two things. Letter A, it benefits us. I said earlier, it's not primarily transactional, but there are incentives attached to certain commands, and this is a big one. Look at verse 32. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? Even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, massive, bountiful. It's going to be ridiculous how God blesses you if you can obey this verse. That's on him. He said it. It's written in red. His integrity relies upon proving that that is true. In this life, the one to come, you will be blessed beyond measure if you can get this one right. We talk about the Florida lottery. We say, oh, wouldn't it be great to hit the Florida lottery? I don't think states ought to be involved in the lottery, but that's a sermon for a different day. Um, I am very tempted to go off on that right now, but I won't do it. However, it's a joke in comparison to the blessing he promises you if you can love your enemies. If you can get this right, you're, you're hearing the, the, you remember the old cashier, the cha-ching, you know, when you would, somebody would, would do the arm on the cash register and it would cha-ching. Yeah, it's just going off like crazy in heaven when you do good to those who are hateful toward you. It benefits you. Tactically, it's the life force, life force of the gospel. Forgiven people forgive people. Forgiveness and generosity and grace experienced results in forgiveness, generosity, and grace expressed. It's the life force of our kingdom message. It bewilders the lost world. It irritates the devil. It inspires the church, and it lends credibility to everything we do here at the church. Jesus says, obey me in this area, and I've got your back. It benefits us. Letter B, it's becoming to us. Verse 35, the B part. And you will be sons of the Most High, for he's kind and ungrateful, uh, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful even as your Father is merciful. When I go back to Alabama, to my home region, we hear this almost every time we go. Someone somewhere will say, I don't know which one you are, but you've got to be one of those Terry's. We all look real similar. We're all built about the same way. We all have blue eyes. We all have certain facial features. I can look back generations as long as they've made pictures. They all look the same. Uh, We have about 10 pages in the phone book, you know, I mean, when they had phone books. It, it It was a bunch of us, and we all have very similar qualities. So people will say, you must be one of those Terry's. I don't know which one you are, but you must be one of them. In the same way, Jesus says, if you forgive your enemies and if you do good to those who despise you, that people are going to say, you must be one of those Christians. I I saw how that lady talked to you at the supermarket. And then I saw how you responded to her. I don't know which one you are. I don't know if you're Baptist or Methodist or Episcopal or Presbyterian. I don't know which one, what kind you are, but I looked a lot like Jesus. You must be a child of God. It's becoming to you. You look like who God has already declared you to be. Well, the opposite's true. If you're mean to those who are mean to you, you don't look like one of us. You don't look like a believer. If you go on Facebook and you berate your enemy, it just is not becoming. 
It doesn't look like you. If you get back and you insult and return for insult, have you ever thought about what the Scripture says as Jesus hung on the cross? He did not return insult for insult. He hung there on the cross as they were spitting upon him, as they were humiliating him, as they were cutting him, and said, forgive them, Lord. They don't know what they're doing. And when you do the same, you look like that man on the cross. And the world watching recognizes the similarity. You know, this air that you're breathing... The wickedest man in Nassau County is breathing also. Atheists who deny the existence of your creator, they're breathing the same air. The sunrise, wasn't it beautiful this morning? The sunrise you enjoyed this morning. It doesn't matter what stripe they're of, they're, they enjoyed the same sunrise as you did. God is good to the just and the unjust. And in the same way, you go and do likewise, you see man came to a Christian counselor and he said uh, I'm fed up with my wife I want a divorce let me say hypothetically or parenthetically um, business people tend to like niche markets and people like to use that word Christian very very loosely a Christian is one who is opening the Bible and counseling you from Scripture you understand just because they have it over their door doesn't mean it's actually Christian the Christian will, will separate themselves by doing this. Hold on just a minute. Let me show you this verse. That's what makes a Christian different than a secular counselor. Nine times out of ten, there's absolutely zero difference. I'm just telling you. There's absolutely zero difference in the two. But this was an actual Christian counselor. The man comes. He says, I want a divorce. And Christian says, well, the Bible says there are certain grounds for that. You know, you, 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 God, God can grant that. And, but, you know, have they been unfaithful? They committed adultery? The man said, no. Why do you want a divorce, he said. Guys, I'm just, I just don't, don't want to have anything to do with her. I don't love her anymore. Well, the Christian counselor said, well, good news, because love is not an emotion. It's, a, it's an action verb. And, and a matter of fact, you're commanded to do it. It says, husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church. And the guy said, sir, you don't understand even want to be around her. I don't even want to be in the same house with her. He says, well, here's what you do. You go and you buy the house next door because the Bible says, love your neighbor as yourself. He says, you're not hearing me. I can't stand her. I can't even, I can't, I don't, I, I hate her. And he says, well, that's fine because the Bible says, love your enemies. The next week, the fella got a secular counselor. And that's what they do, by the way. They keep going until they find one that tells them what they already wanted to hear. But God's told us today what we need to hear. He says, trust me, this is for the advancement of the kingdom. Look at that one that that nail-scarred hand has pointed to and love them. I've done ministry all over the world this past week, streets of Cuba, and some dark places. One church, there was a, a satanic church, uh, the Santeria religion was set up right across the street from it. This Wednesday night, I'm going to tell stories from what we experienced in Cuba. You will want to be there if you're able. But I've been in Cuba, been to the murder capital of the world which at the time was Tegucigalpa, Honduras. It's dominated by street gangs. I've been to Albania, the gateway to the Middle East. I've been all over the world serving the king through kingdom enterprises. And here's what I've discovered. God is in the habit of not eradicating his enemies, but redeeming them. And he wants you to be about the same business. Could he eradicate them? Yep. But I sure am glad he didn't. Because I used to be one. So did you. And he looked down at you. 
who are of your father, the devil, who wanted it your way. And he said, I will love you with an everlasting love. Not only will I let the rain fall on you, just like I do my people. He says, I'm going to forgive you of all your sin. Not only that, I'm going to invite you to my table. Not only that, I'm going to adopt you as my very own child. And then I'm going to use you for my purpose in my kingdom. Aren't you glad God doesn't just eradicate his enemies? Go and do likewise. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Thank you so much for joining us today here at FB First at Home. We truly appreciate you spending time with us here. Right now, our church service is going through a time of decision. We believe that every time the Bible is taught, it requires a response. So what's your response? We'd love to hear from you. Feel free to DM us or leave a comment and we'll have a pastor respond with some possible next steps. If this was your first time with us, we hope you enjoyed it and were encouraged. We'd love to see you in person next Sunday. Remember, you can head over to fbfirst.com at any time to plan your Sunday visit with us. But to everyone, we hope you have a great week. God bless.